Most of my memories as a little girl are in a volleyball gym. My neighbor, Betsy, I wanted to be just like her. So she played volleyball, I wanted to play volleyball. I was a terrible drawer, but ended up drawing a picture of myself and I had a USA jersey on and shockingly enough, it was number seven. We single filed into the gym and the first step that I took, I just had these crazy chills. It was a really emotional moment for me. What do you want volleyball to do for you? Where do you want this path to take you? I want to be on the USA Olympic team. I want to play in the Olympics one day. Surreal is the word that I have to use because it's something that I never have experienced before. We are committed. We are uplifting. We are strong. We are authentic. On the field. In the classroom. In the community. It's not just something we do. It's how we live. It's our way. Always pushing one another. Working towards the same vision. Stronger together. This is the CUSA way. We're a university founded on the side of an airport, reaching new heights. It's in our DNA. And since then, we've dedicated ourselves to solving the big problems facing our community and the world. We believe that crazy startup idea isn't so crazy, that families without health care shouldn't have to go it alone. We believe we can be better prepared for the next hurricane, and that our coral reefs can be saved. And that's because, above all else, we believe in you. Well, the fall semester continues, the 2018 season rolls on. The bye week completes homecoming on the horizon. Generations of Panthers clad in blue and gold ready to return to the roots in support of FIU and what will be a Saturday night clash with all sorts of conference implications. Thanks for joining us once again on Panther Talk Live with Butch Davis. I'm AJ Ricketts, glad to have you with us here in the Graham Center and on Facebook Live as well. Well, Coach, bye week and off week aren't necessarily synonymous. Sometimes you have an overload of work and preparation, yeah. but it comes at a good time before the start of conference play, that middle ground between non-conference and CUSA games. So good timing, and how did the bye week go for you guys? You know what, AJ, I think it went really good. Uh, we got a chance to accomplish an awful lot of things. Obviously, we got a chance to get our players healthy. We only practiced three times last week, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. A little bit on Tuesday was about things that we needed to improve on. After we did some analytical studies and looked at the things that we're not doing as well as we'd like to, yeah. spent a lot of time doing that. A little sprinkling in on Wednesday and Thursday with Middle Tennessee, waiting for them to play their final game against Marshall on Friday night before you put the icing on the, the computers and all the different cut-ups and stuff. And then we got a chance for the first time to actually get out on the road. And our coaches hit the road. They went out recruiting all day Thursday afternoon, all day Friday and Saturday. Went to some high school games, went to practices. Got a chance to see an awful lot of kids, which I think is critically important this time of the year because, and especially because of the uh, early signing date yeah. in December, that the more you get out and get a chance to be seen, and then obviously to watch these kids to make some final decisions, it was really an a very important week for us. What's the usual? Is it hard to find a bye week balance between preparation for the next team and getting a head start and, and giving your guys a little bit of a break? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think obviously, and, and people that follow the football program, the one thing that you know, AJ, you know, we went through about three and a half weeks of training camp during the month of August. It's a complete grind. I mean, it's practicing every day, no games, and so it's really, you know, uh, it takes its toll on the, on the player's body. Then you jump in, and for the first time, we played five games in the month of September. So almost half of the season was accomplished during the first month of, uh, of the year. So that's a, that's a real grind on the players. So it was good to be able to give the players an opportunity to get some time off. They had Friday off, they had Saturday off. We brought them in Sunday afternoon. Now we had a chance to really totally focus on Middle Tennessee, and so we got a, a, a really a good jump start to the week yesterday afternoon. Before we talk Middle Tennessee, let's recap. It's been a couple of weeks. So let's talk about that good victory over Arkansas Pine Bluff a couple of weeks ago. Offense was rolling, 613 sure. yards of total offense. Devontae Price had one of the best games yeah. of his career, a career high, 110 yards, two rushing touchdowns. Let's start with James Morgan, though. Nine for 14. 341 yards, and, yeah. he, and he tied a school record for, for passing touchdowns yeah, in a single game. You talk about efficiency, he had that. 
Yeah, I, I tell you, James is starting to feel significantly more comfortable in the offense. The more he gets a chance to practice with the players, understand, because there's a lot of things that go into the timing, AJ. Obviously, you know, seeing the body language of a player that lets you know when somebody's going to get into a break and out of a break, and how they lean in on, on a defender, and are they going to break away, or are they going to take it over the top? So, you know, every single week, obviously, he has a chance to continue to improve and to get better. He understands the scheme, and he's starting to understand that, obviously, you know, it's not as important sometimes to make explosive big plays as it is to make sure you don't make bad plays, but everything worked. The protection was good, the running game was working, the play action passes, and he was able to get some shots down the field, four touchdown passes, and it was a great accomplishment by the offense. 341 yards. Yeah. And you, you talk about quarterback efficiency. You know, sometimes you'll see quarterbacks with 25, 30 completions, but the, the efficiency isn't there. Oftentimes, a high completion percentage means you're not moving the ball down the field. What do you, when you look at quarterbacks and analyze, you know, that, that's oftentimes not what you're looking for these days is completion percentage. Well, it was funny at the time. I think when we, when we actually, at one point late in the third quarter, we had only run like 38 offensive plays. The offense had so much success. We had, drive, we had three drives where we scored the first play of the drive. You know, some were passes, some were long runs. And, uh, but the, the good thing about that, A.J., was is it gave us a chance to play an awful lot of the second and third team players. Christian Alexander got a chance to go in, drive the team down, score and play. And as we've said all season long, the more times that you get a chance to help your second team quarterback be prepared if the un unfortunate thing happens like last year in the bowl game where you lose your starter, now, obviously, you know, you're significantly more prepared for it. You wanted to get a lot of guys in the rotation, and obviously that happened. Left by you fans were able to see a lot of the young, exciting prospects, including a couple of fresh periods. Gaskin, his first catch, yeah. a touchdown pass, yeah. 75 yards into the end zone. Did the T.Y. Hilton celebration following sure. that, and you put in Sean Peterson on that final drive, too. He had 10 carries. 38 yards right. and was able to secure a couple first downs to, to run out the clock and, and plenty of other freshmen were able to get some playing time. What you think in some of their first appearances? Yeah, I'll tell you what, I think that uh, Gaskin, uh, obviously the big play, but he had another catch earlier that yeah. he made a great job catching the ball, protecting it, running, running through some tackles. So that part was good. And then getting Sean Peterson, we would like to have had him a little, maybe a little bit earlier in the right. year, not only in the running back position, but, a, but to be able to help us with special teams. But he, he had been fighting a hamstring injury uh, probably the first three games of the season, he was not even eligible or not even healthy enough to be able to play. So get him in, get his feet wet, get a chance to, I think, like you said, I think he had like eight consecutive carries, and it was just pounding the rock, running the ball, running the ball, moving the chains, making first downs, and then we got the ball down close to the goal line, and, you know, we took a knee to, uh, obviously, to try not to run the score sure. up and everything. But it was uh, it was good for all the guys to, one, you get the win, two, you get a chance to play an awful lot of players. And we, we talked about Devontae Price, how he had the career high in rushing yards. One thing we've noticed this year is he's being used a lot more out of the backfield, right. not just on jet sweeps or motion plays or, or out into the flat to receive, but he's really being utilized out of the backfield, a lot of tough carries, and then, he, of course, he had that big dash for a touchdown. You know, A.J., I mean, when you watched uh, Devontae play in high school, I mean, he was an excellent high school football player. He was a track player. He was a, a very accomplished hurdler. So this is a guy that I that has an awful lot of skills that you can utilize him. He doesn't always have to be in the backfield. You can misplace him, put him out as a wide receiver. You can put him in the slot. Uh, you know, he's one of those kind of guys that you want to try to create opportunities to make sure that he gets touches in the game. Whatever it takes for him to get, you know, he got a little bit of a dose of it last year when he kind of came in as the third and the fourth running back and got some touches and some carries and made some plays. He does an excellent job for us on special teams. So uh, we're, we're very grateful to have him on the team. All right, Coach, before we go to break, really probably the only disappointing thing to see coming out of that Pine Bluff week was, was Furman Silva's status. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll pull up his tweet here. Uh, Furman will be out uh, for the rest of the season with an injury. Obviously, been, has been a huge playmaker for FIU, led the team uh, in tackles for loss and sacks last season along the defensive line, and even shifting between linebacker and D-line this year, but obviously a leader yeah. on the defense. And it's going to be tough to lose a leader like that. Yeah, you know, I mean, the last year when we inherited this football team, there was a couple of guys that, uh, that had a significant history of play. And obviously, Anthony Wynn and Trayvon Williams had been starters. And Furman Silva was kind of in that group of guys because he had been a starter for the previous two seasons. An excellent pass rusher. His motor, he just goes a million miles an hour. And it's, it's really sad that, you know, he got injured during practice on Thursday. And uh, But just listening to him, 
As soon as he went in on the surgery the next morning, he, he actually called me from the from the recovery room and yeah. says, Coach, I'll be back, I'll be stronger, I'll be bigger, I'll be faster. He said, count on me being there. And I, he said, tell all the players, he said, I love them, wish them good luck, and win the game. He'll certainly be a leader whether or not he, he's on the field. He will be around this program. And Herman Silva out for the season, but still around the program without a doubt. All right, when we come back, we'll preview Middle Tennessee. It's homecoming week at FIU. The Blue Raiders coming to town this week, and we'll preview Middle Tennessee when we return on Panther Talk Live with Butch Davis. Stay with us. Most of my memories as a little girl are in a volleyball gym. My neighbor, Betsy, I wanted to be just like her. So she played volleyball, I wanted to play volleyball. I was a terrible drawer, but ended up drawing a picture of myself and I had a USA jersey on, and shockingly enough, it was number seven. We single filed into the gym, and the first step that I took, I just had these crazy chills. It was a really emotional moment for me. What do you want volleyball to do for you? Where do you want this path to take you? I want to be on the USA Olympic team. I want to play in the Olympics one day. Surreal is the word that I have to use because it's something that I never have experienced before. We are committed. We are uplifting. We are strong. We are authentic. On the field. In the classroom. In the community. It's not just something we do. It's how we live. It's our way. Always pushing one another. Working towards the same vision. Stronger together. This is the CUSA way. University founded on the site of an airport, reaching new heights, it's in our DNA. And since then, we've dedicated ourselves to solving the big problems facing our community and the world. We believe that crazy startup idea isn't so crazy, that families without health care shouldn't have to go it alone. We believe we can be better prepared for the next hurricane, and that our coral reefs can be saved. And that's because, above all else, we believe in you. Well, there is no doubt that Ricardo Silva Stadium has precedence when it comes to atmosphere. This from the 2011 homecoming matchup with Duke, a sellout crowd, a raucous environment. And that's the environment we hope to replicate this weekend against Middle Tennessee on homecoming night, Saturday night. A lot of conference implications in CUSA play. AJ Ricketts alongside Butch Davis. This is Panther Talk live from the Graham Center. All right. Uh, tweeted out last week if you have any questions for Butch. Uh, FIUJM, John Machado wanted to ask, what can we learn from last year's game against MTSU that will help us win this year? It's kind of a disjointed game. Thomas Owens had a great performance, but what do you remember? What have you seen on film from last year's game that can help you moving forward? He wants to know. Yeah, well, one of the things, obviously, I think Middle Tennessee was a good team last year. I think they're much better this year. They're more talented. They're bigger, stronger. But the thing that you look at and you compare last year's film to this year's tape that we're getting a chance to watch is they, on defense, they're probably the most diversified defense that we've played the entire season. Most teams have got a defensive scheme. It's a four-man defensive line or it's a three-man defensive line. And there are either two linebackers and five defensive backs and stuff. A lot of teams are. These guys, they literally, almost every down and distance with personnel, they will change. They'll be in a 4-3, they'll be in a 4-2, they'll be in a 3-3, they'll be in a 3-5. I mean, they have a lot of multiple ways in which they try to defend people. They also probably bring as much pressure as anybody that we play. Uh, the quarterback's doing an excellent job. He didn't play last year. It's the head coach's son, and he is very, very athletic. You look at the things that brought them back because in the first half against Marshall, Marshall was having a lot of uh, success putting pressure on the quarterback. They started putting him on the perimeter, breaking the containment, getting outside by design, sprint outs and bootlegs and naked plays so that he gets on the perimeter because his legs give him a chance. If nobody's open, he can tuck the ball and he can actually run and pick up first downs. 
very talented young man. When a defensive line is adjusting as much as they are, as you mentioned, like three down linemen or five yep. sometimes bringing pressure, how much responsibility does that put on a quarterback to communicate yep. with his offensive line, make changes at the line throughout the course of the game? How much responsibility do you anticipate James Morgan having to have? Yeah, in a, game like a this? lot, of, a lot, AJ. Obviously, he and, and Dallas Cannell, the offensive center, they've got to be on the same page as far as identifying who they think are the guys that potentially are going to be the pressure guys. It may not necessarily be the guys closest to the line of scrimmage. It could be a corner, it could be a linebacker, it could be a strong safety. So you have to make sure that the, that the uh, protection matches up, that the quarterback knows who the hot guys are and who the, who the guys that are going to get picked up on. And so obviously it's a, it puts a lot of burden on the quarterback, but it puts a lot of burden on the offensive line as well. Their quarterback, you referenced him, Brent Stock, still seems like he's been at Murfreesboro for a fair amount of time. Yeah. Yeah, a red shirt senior, but boy, this guy is talented. He's thrown for over 10,000 yards in his career, one of only three active quarterbacks to have done that. He's led his team to victories on the road at Syracuse, of course, beat Clemson last year. He's led him to a victory at Missouri, coming off a 341-yard game against Marshall. What does it take to contain a dual threat quarterback in Brent Stockton. A, a lot of things about the entire offense that they run, you better be disciplined because obviously discipline and containing the quarterback, but discipline and gap control in the run because if you're just flying up the field or you're out of control as far as your defensive line, the inside linebackers, they will gas you. They will run the ball. They run counters and powers and hand the ball off to really tough physical running backs and they will make you play honestly. And so uh, from a defensive standpoint, you better be very, very disciplined and know your assignment and do your job. That game last year was the only loss in a stretch of six games. The team was rolling. I think they won five out of six. The only loss was to Middle Tennessee. It was just an odd game. They, they used a wildcat formation to a lot of success. Tavares Thomas came out of nowhere to have three touchdowns. John Urzuba played one of the best games of his career. What comes to mind when you think of that game? What, what went wrong? What, yeah. it's just like we, I said it was disjointed, but what was it in your mind? I, I never felt like that we were ever, you know, like 100% totally focused. We had turnovers, we had some issues and protections, and, and there was some conflicts between the quarterback and the offensive line, and yeah. guys were just, you know, there was way too much arguing. And, uh, you know, after that, I really think that it helped us as a team kind of realize how critically important it is Everybody's got to be on the same page. It, it, it can't be, well, the quarterback sees it this way, the receiver sees it this way. The offensive line, and I think it helped us straighten some things out that eventually paid some dividends and helped us win some games. Yeah, you guys went back-to-back -back games yeah. following that, so something worked out after the trip to Murfreesboro last season. All right, when we come up for our final segment on Panther Talk Live, the defensive coordinator for FIU, Brent Guy, will has a history of Butch dating back to 1980. We'll take a look at a nice team photo and some more when we return on Panther Talk Live with Butch Davis. Most of my memories as a little girl are in a volleyball gym. My neighbor, Betsy, I wanted to be just like her. So she played volleyball, I wanted to play volleyball. I was a terrible drawer, but ended up drawing a picture of myself and I had a USA jersey on and shockingly enough, it was number seven. We single filed into the gym and the first step that I took, I just had these crazy chills. It was a really emotional moment for me. What do you want volleyball to do for you? Where do you want this path to take you? I want to be on the USA Olympic team. I want to play in the Olympics one day. Surreal is the word that I have to use because it's something that I never have experienced before. We are committed. We are uplifting. We are strong. We are authentic. On the field. In the classroom. In the community. It's not just something we do. It's how we live. It's our work. Always pushing one another. Working towards the same vision. Stronger together. This is the CUSA way. We're a university founded on the side of an airport, reaching new heights. It's in our DNA. And since then, we've dedicated ourselves to solving the big problems facing our community and the world. We believe that crazy startup idea isn't so crazy, that families without health care shouldn't have to go it alone. We believe we can be better prepared for the next hurricane, and that our coral reefs can be saved. And that's because, above all else, we believe in you.
another beautiful day at FIU as you take a look at some aerial shots of campus brought to you by Optagon Media Services. Thanks for joining us on Panther Talk Live with Butch Davis. Some more moderate temperatures the past week or two. It feels like fall in Miami, only about 84, 85 right now. It must feel good for the guys in the morning. It absolutely is starting to become fall. <laughs> if there is such a thing as yeah, our, our perspective of fall is always disjointed. <laughs> And you're out to work where there actually is fall is your old stomping grounds in Stillwater. All right, I know last week or two weeks ago, we talked about your days as a GA and gluing the tape together and sending it off to the next place. A lot of great stories there. But before our Pine Bluff broadcast, we got our hands on this team photo from the 1980 Oklahoma State team. We'll pull it up uh, right now. 1980 Oklahoma State. We'll, we'll zoom in here. Butch, there you are on the left side behind number seven. You've got something I think is known as flow going on, exactly. <laughs> going on right here. Exactly. And, and, and maybe if you don't have it by now, it's only by choice. It's only by choice. You've got Brent Guy over there, 13, the defensive coordinator now for FIU. Talk about that relationship, how it's developed over the years. You've gone from being his coach to seeing him grow and develop over the years, and now you're a defensive coordinator. Yeah, very, very proud and glad to have him as part of the program here. Uh, Brent came actually to Oklahoma State as a walk-on, as a linebacker. During the early years when Jimmy took the job at Oklahoma State, and the program was decimated. I mean, had lost a lot of scholarships, uh, had been put on probation. So Jimmy was, you know, had a challenge of rebuilding the program. Well, I was the receiver coach, tight end coach, and I was also the recruiting coordinator. So we sent out uh, hundreds of letters trying to get walk-ons, and we ended up getting an awful lot of kids that actually came yeah. to the Oklahoma State program, and Brent being one of them, came in as a, a walk-on, earned a, uh, opportunities to play on special teams, earned a scholarship, ended up becoming a starting linebacker there. And obviously with the defensive background of Jimmy Johnson, Pat Jones, who was the defensive coordinator who became the head coach, you know, that really helped Brent jumpstart his career. And then from then on, you know, he's had a chance to be a head coach at Utah State. He's been the defensive coordinator at Arizona State, at Tulsa. Uh, he's, he's seen an awful lot of things. And one of the things that I trust with Brent is the fact that we share so many philosophies of similarity because our roots all go back to Oklahoma State right. and go back to the Jimmy Johnson days. And so it's easy to talk about things to him because we share an awful lot of the similar background. Well, he's a Boise State defensive coordinator for three years and helped guide them to their first conference championships at the D1 level, yep. right as Boise State was beginning their run. And then, of course, at Arizona State, one of the best defenses in the country, it'll help to have Terrell Suggs there with yep. him and, and coach a guy like that. Uh, and then, of course, did the same thing as the defensive coordinator at Tulsa when they won the conference USA championship in 2012. But you look at that photo, and that's a who's who of, of future coaches right there. You got yourself, Brent, of course, Jimmy Johnson, Houston Nutt, Matt Jones, you mentioned, Steve Logan, and, and Dave Wanstead was yeah. on that staff. I mean, that's a, that's a squad right there. That's a whole, a whole lot of great guys. People don't know much about Steve Logan, but Steve had been a high school coach like I had been there in Oklahoma. He came in, joined as a graduate assistant, did the same thing, spliced the tapes, and went on to become the head coach and probably the most successful head coach at East Carolina University. Yeah. Did an excellent job there. And obviously Dave Juan has been the head coach of the Dolphins, the Chicago Bears, uh, had a great career in the NFL and, and a great collegiate career. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of great guys there. And, and one of the things I think that everybody that was a part of that staff, we were all young and we were all learning and, uh, and I think we learned to appreciate how valuable that everybody was, that the trust factor yeah. with your coaching staff. Do you trust these guys to make sure they turn over every single rock to make sure that the team is as best prepared that they can possibly be? It's many fond memories, I'm sure, of your time in Stillwater. Yeah. Hey, let me ask you, I know it's homecoming week here, so you proceeding Stillwater in your high school coaching career. You were at Arkansas, of course. Remember any homecoming concerts you went to in Fayetteville? I know they had Miguel here last night. He was blaring over at the stadium. Do you remember, were there homecoming concerts in Fayetteville you went to? As a, as a player, you don't obviously get a chance to do that. Thing. <laughs> but true, I remember yeah. some of the opponents. It used to be, it seemed like almost every year Arkansas would play Rice, okay? Yeah. And they would always do the fraternities and sororities and do decoration. And instead of the Rice Owls, it was always the Rice Krispies. It would be cereal boxes. <laughs> And you'd try to win the game 50 to nothing. Yeah. You know, beat Rice really bad. That's great. Good times. Uh, before we finish here, I'm going to go back to Pine Bluff real quick. So a great story. I mentioned it on air. Their, their kicker and punter who had a terrific game, all right, Jamie Gillen. To make a long story short, he lived in England and Scotland growing up. His dad was in the Royal Air Force for 22 years. So when the kid was 16, he got the chance to come to America. Okay. 16 years old, he's at a high school football practice. Sees the kicker kicking into the rear end of the, of the long snapper. He goes up to his coach and says, I think I can do better than that. I was a pretty good rugby player across the pond in Scotland. 
but he doesn't know what to do with his talent. His buddy sends Arkansas Pine Bluff his highlight tape because Pine Bluff had posted on Facebook that they needed a kicker. I mean, you gotta, you gotta find gay guys any way you can. So because of a Facebook post, a kid from Scotland, who's only here because his dad was in the military, winds up in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Yeah. Is there any recruit, any success story, any guy you've ever recruited in your 30 plus years of coaching that, that you look back and you're like, how did I get this guy to come here? <laughs> I do have one little story like okay. that, but yeah. I'm gonna tell you, he is a terrific kid. He was great. And, and the National Football League came to our game to watch him because he's on the radar of all 32 NFL teams. But one of the stories, as an assistant coach at the University of Miami, I was the recruiting coordinator, and I used to get all this mail all the time from kids from all over the country. I'd love to come to Miami, yeah. want to play for Jimmy Johnson and all these kinds of things. And so I opened up a letter, and it's from a young man. He says, it's one of my goals and dreams to play at Miami, and uh, I would like for you guys to recruit me. I'm a junior getting ready to be a senior next year. Can you put my name on the recruiting list? Right. Long story short, it was Jesse Armstead who was the National Player of the Year defensively in the country and obviously went to the University of Miami and then had a great career in the National Football League. But it, very easily you could have taken that letter and just thrown it into the trash and never gotten Jesse Armstrong. Well, how do you know what letters to take seriously? You open them all. <laughs> and, you, and, you, and you go back and you start calling coaches Tell, send yeah. me some film and let me take a look at this kid. Or someone on staff opens yeah. it all and lets you know, hey, take a look at this guy. <laughs> take a look, absolutely. <laughs> Coach, that's great. Uh, as we finish things off, just one last thing. Well, what's important against Middle Tennessee State this weekend? A lot of talent. You, you, we, we have a winning conference play already. 1-0, they picked up a couple, including a really dramatic, gutsy win over FAU, a two-point conversion in the final minute. So this has a lot of implications. What's important? What are you going to emphasize to the guys? I know it's Monday, but what do you want to see out of your team this weekend? You know, AJ, there's always some keys to victory, and obviously one of them is going to be make sure that you kind of try to keep the quarterback as best as possible in the pocket. Don't let him get outside because when he explodes, not only can he throw the ball deep and come up with big explosive plays, he's got the legs to extend it to, to keep drives alive by scrambling. Obviously on the offensive side of it, with all the different fronts and all the different blitzes and the looks, you've got to make sure that you minimize the negative plays, tackles for losses, sacks. If you can eliminate those kinds of things, it's going to give you a fighting chance every time to move the ball offensively. And then special teams, it usually comes down, you've got to find a way to make a, some explosive plays yeah. and, and win the hidden field yardage so that when your offense takes the field, they get a chance to have good field position to give a chance to score. Yeah, hopefully Maurice Alexander gets yeah, a couple exactly. of opportunities. That He's been be explosive good. thus far this season. All right, Coach. Best of luck this weekend. We're looking forward to Saturday nights under the lights. Thank Best you, of luck. Jay. We'll see you Thursday for our pregame interview. This has been Panther Talk Live with Butch Davis. We'll see you Saturday night, homecoming, Ricardo Silva Stadium. It's going to be a lot of fun. Appreciate your time. We'll see you next week.